Good evening, all. Um, I'm Tab, or more formally, Tab as a Binding, and I'd like to welcome you all to week two of the Riverside Sunderland University Design Challenge. I work for the Timber Trade Federation and um, TRADA, delivering the University Engagement Programme. So if you're a student, then uh, head to TRADA um, Academic, don't register up here, head to the academic page, sign up here in the nice orange box, and then you'll get access to 63 modules, ah, or even 63 units, eight modules, an infinite number of whiz sheets, 100 plus case studies, and especially released for you um, as books online so that you can access these for this competition, timber frame construction. And Robin Lancashire will come and talk to us um, about timber frame construction next week. Um, Offsite and industrialized timber construction. Robert Hairstan spoke to us last week. Uh, Cross laminated timber. I'm sure you, some of them will be using them in your designs. Structural timber elements. Um, and newly out designing timber structures, James Norman will come and talk to us on in week four. So this is week two, sustainable construction, and this is evening two. And I'd like to hand over to Gwyn Roberts to chair tonight's meeting. Thank you, Tabitha, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Gwyn Roberts uh, from BRE Building Research Establishment. Um, just by a little bit of introduction in terms of who BRE are. So BRE, it's actually 2021 is our centenary year. So um, it's we're, we've got quite a bit of history about us. Um, previously we used to be part of government, but uh, were privatized in 1997. Um, what we do is we, we test things, we blow things up, we try and break things, we try and set fire to things, we do research around things, we have a, a, an innovation park where people can come and try and build all sorts of different buildings and just a safe state space to play basically. All of that gets turned into uh, our, our in-depth research, we uh, create standards, we help government uh, set regulation and then we also do a fair amount of training and uh, various things like that. We have a very good graduate program which has just opened, I might just drop that in there um, and always looking for excellent graduates and I'm sure hopefully there's a number on the line here. Um, so we, we take quite a wide angle view of what goes on in, in the built environment. Um, probably some of our key focuses are around productivity in terms of modern methods of construction um, obviously the the drive towards net zero um, we like to think that uh, we declared a climate emergency sort of 30 40 years ago when everybody else was still in their nappies um, and and obviously uh, a key area for us is is building safety um, we have uh, one of the the, the, the biggest uh, fire testing chambers in in in, in Europe um, and, and that, that's obviously a key focus post post Grenfell and, and actually I think it's really important to have organizations that join those those two key challenges that we have in in the built environment at this moment in time um, I've been at BRE uh, for about eight years or so, um, uh, probably really unhelpfully, I'm, I'm not a built environment graduate, so I actually studied international politics and conflict resolution, so perhaps one of, some, one of you might become an MI5 officer or something like that in the future to swap around a bit. Um, I, I came into the built environment via working in, in the building regulations team in, in government. I, I worked on things like zero carbon homes and code sustainable homes and all of that kind of thing. Yes, that is my fault. Um, so tonight we have uh, some of the finalists from uh, Home of 2030. So it's um, it, 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 Home of 2030 has was about a year of my life uh, last year, and um, we worked with government. So that was Department for uh, Business, Energy and Skills, um, MHCLG. So that's the 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 government department responsible for building regulations and planning and then also department for health and social care um, which I think is a really key element of bringing that aging aspect and the whole point of it was to basically try and bring together 
some really key challenges, some grand challenges that we have of society of now. So those those four key objectives in terms of um, that that wide scalability and that need for more homes, uh, healthy living. You know, we will probably put a bit too much weight on, particularly after being at home too much. So we need to be uh, uh, healthy. We need to be active. We don't want to be living in the car all the time. And some of us are getting older, probably lost the hair. I think that might be home 2030 that caused that. Um, and, and actually our housing needs to be adaptable to that. Um, and then obviously we have some pretty major uh, climate challenges, for, whether that's the need to address uh, net zero carbon, biodiversity, uh, our challenge in terms of biodiversity, but also uh, those, those wider subject areas around that. So we work with government, we work with Reba and also Moby. So we've got Mark Southgate on the call. Um, Mark uh, ran um, a competition for uh, the young people. Hello, Mark. Um, and we got some brilliant entries and, and some of the ideas and inspiration in that, I, I think, uh, made some of the adult competition, uh, that I like to call it the professional competition that we, we worked with Reba on. Um, uh, yeah, they made, made some of them. So. So that the, the professional competition, we had, I think, around uh, 300 or so entries overall. So it was, it was well, a, a good, good number of different entries, a lot of different collaborations from all across the world, some really brilliant ideas. Those were whittled down to, I think, 29. Uh, shows that we were thinking about it rather than around 30. And then um, that was then whittled down into six finalists. So tonight uh, we have two of those finalists to talk in much more depth about uh, their, uh, their, their designs and how all their different disciplines made up their design. Because the key thing with Home 2030, it's not just one element. It's not just that environmental challenge. It's all those different challenges put together. So I've gone way over time as ever. So um, uh, I shall pass over very quickly to uh, Adrian, I think, and uh, and Patrick and the rest of the Positive Collection who will introduce themselves and talk you through their design. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, good evening, everybody. Um, first, uh, a very big thank you to uh, Tabitha for inviting us all along to this um, lecture series. Uh, I'm really looking forward to my own bit of CPD this evening um, as well. So um, we're going to talk about our design called Positive House. That was, as noted, one of the six uh, national finalists for the competition. And that's positive because we wanted to emphasise uh, an ambition for, for positive positive also because we wanted to suggest a more progressive um, viewpoint about market-based solutions that were scalable uh, but met this series of complex and interconnected issues that Gwen was talking about such as net zero carbon, better health uh, and well-being, age inclusivity as well and um, Positive Collective also, because we really enjoyed the engagement so much together uh, through the competition, we wanted to explore new opportunities to develop and communicate the ideas within it, like uh, here tonight. So we're very um, happy to come along. Um, as they're all integrated and ideas, it takes an interdisciplinary team to uh, deliver that. And although there's only four of us here tonight um, dealing with structure, architecture and landscape and energy. There's a much broader team that uh, came together uh, to produce this overall design. So it's, it's really much, very much about collaboration. So let me just quickly let everybody um, here tonight introduce themselves. Um, I'll start, I'm Adrian Campbell. I'm the founder and uh, director of the collective engine engineering firm called Change Building. And I'm going to talk uh, about the structure and on off-site manufacturing approach tonight. Kate? Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I'm a landscape architect from Exterior Architecture. So I'll be talking about um, the landscape approach for this game. Hi, I'm Flo um, and I'm a mechanical engineer and passive house designer. 
I'll talk about energy a bit later on. Um, and then we'll have a good Q&A session. <laughs> and I'm Patrick uh, from Perpendicular Architecture, setting that up now a couple of years ago. So I'll finish up and uh, talk a little bit about architecture. So I, it's, I think it's really important for us to also identify some of the broader themes that actually underpin uh, our design response overall. And one of the more important ones to us were very much influencing the urban and landscaping approach that Patrick and Kate are going to talk more about um, is how we transition from only thinking about minimizing impacts in construction, so-called degenerating processes to one where we can improve our environment and progress to a state where human and natural systems are more in balance, that so-called regenerative cultures. So the ways that we can connect back to nature. So the competition itself was a really great opportunity for us to kind of road test these emerging ideas to move beyond the concept of static sustainability, even if net zero carbon is probably quite hard to deliver in itself. So, and if you go to try and solve complex and interconnected problems at scale, uh, it's also important to think about overall systems. So while the competition asked for a housing solution for a given site, uh, we wanted to start thinking also about uh, national net zero carbon targets and what made sense to achieve that, kind of overall manufacturing methods, ecosystem restoration to add to address kind of massive biodiversity loss and circular processes that might lead us to reduce consumption in the industry over time. So it's no surprise really that bio-based material solutions using natural capital and broader national ecosystem repair are embedded in our approach. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Kate who'll take your, talk about the master plan and landscape strategy. Cool, thanks Adrian. Um, so yeah, so as Adrian's already alluded to, um, I guess responding to a brief that calls for sort of a, a standardised approach um, to, a, to a design, um, one that sort of is going to work for any site or any community is a really difficult task. Um, and it's ex exceptionally difficult from a landscape perspective, because obviously no one context is the same as the next. And so equally, what's, what's really sustainable in one location is often not going to be very sustainable or even appropriate to implement elsewhere. Um, and then even more so from an ecological perspective, um, the most suitable mix of habitats um, that's made up of the most distinctive species and is the most unique to that place is going to be sort of so variable from site to site. And so it should be. So that's something that we really wanted to factor in here um, and build into this sort of systematic approach um, that we were taking how can we draw on a place's sort of unique aspects um, and use them to inform um, our master plan. Um, so this plan here shows our, our test site sits within the thick sort of red um, dashed line and it's only a small portion of that. But what we wanted to do was sort of step back um, and look at the site, how it sits within this sort of wider um, master plan context um, to understand sort of the open space network that's there currently um, and what's being proposed. Um, things like the site's topography, the existing um, blue infrastructure, community facilities, transport network, so that we could draw on those and make sure that we were fitting in um, in a way that was sort of appropriate. Um, our multidisciplinary team benefited um, massively from the input of an ecologist, um, but in the absence of one, there are loads of great places um, for you to look for information and for inspiration um, on a site's biodiversity. Um, such as the local biodiversity action plan or the council's green infrastructure strategy um, and there are a number of sort of online mapping tools as well like Defra's magic map to find out about the sort of unique um, characteristics and habitats that might be found on or near to your site. So um, as we've sort of explained before we got to designing the actual homes themselves in the two hectare site we wanted to sort of step back and think about what might be sort of a systematic and layered approach to configuring the master plan. Um, and we wanted this approach to be sort of flexible enough to work in a number of different locations, um, but also allow for sort of um, place-based interventions to come through. Um, and we felt most importantly that we shouldn't really treat any, any site as an island um, and that we should consider um, 
consider how it can link into its location in sort of a meaningful way. Um, and this, this sort of layering approach um, would ensure that the sustainable solutions that we were integrating weren't just used as sort of um, cookie cutter typologies sort of stamped across the site um, and became sort of more meaningful and actually usable parts of the open space network and the landscape that we were creating. So the layers that we thought were most important to include in the system were things like um, aspects and topography, um, green and blue infrastructure, in the site's ecological layers in order to maximize the potential biodiversity. And then there were the human layers as well. So um, the existing community and how we could provide for their needs, the proposed community and what are their demands for their um, open space network. Um, and then things like civil and roading and infrastructure demands and how to consolidate and rationalize these in a way that champions active travel um, and is also sort of contextually appropriate. And then this top layer here is um, sort of alluding to our, our approach to the social infrastructure and the community infrastructure for the site as well. It was all based on walkability um, and sort of uh, uh, creating walkable neighborhoods. Um, our approach also um, promoted the creation of a series of networks, um, including um, health and wellbeing networks with running tracks and workout pods, active travel provisions and those kind of things. Um, so one of the key debates that emerged um, through this exercise for us was how we balance private, communal and public space in the development and it's a contentious topic um, across a lot of the schemes that we work on right throughout the UK. Um, and particularly during the pandemic, it was a quite an interesting topic for us to go over, you know, everyone sort of thinking what is the value of private outdoor space and what's the value of our, our green spaces that we go and visit and sort of where how should we sort of strike the right balance there, um, particularly in sort of higher density areas where not every unit is situated at ground floor, um, where, where should the line be drawn, um, you know, to maximize sort of usable space for everyone. And so the positive collectives approach really pushed this question um, to, to its limits. Um, and we worked hard to sort of champion communal and public space in order to create more meaningful and functional um, landscape zones including sort of community agricultural plots, um, multi-generational spaces and play spaces for enjoyment by everyone who was, who was going to be living there. Um, and our approach to the treatment of boundaries between the private space and the communal space was also quite contentious. Um, we were questioned about it quite heavily in our, um, in our interview for the competition, um, where we opted for a no fence and no sort of wall um, approach to any of the private terraces and instead we used the, the, fall, the slight sort of fall um, across the site to create softer boundaries through level changes and planting. Um, and in doing this, we ensured that none of our drops were greater than 600 mil so, we did, so that we didn't need any um, balustrades. Um, and this sense of openness was really intentional, sort of as alluded to on the top left diagram, where we wanted the spaces onto which the residents looked from their homes to feel like an extension um, of their own personal space and to increase sort of the visual permeability um, across the site. So this on the right, this is part of our um, two hectare master plan. Um, and the configuration of the plots we used um, intentionally to create sort of a series of landscape rooms um, which strengthen the green infrastructure running east to west across the site. Um, and then the programming and act activation of the spaces was based on walkability as well where we wanted to ensure that every resident was sort of within five minutes walk of um, a food hub and an out, a place to work out outside um, or a two minute walk from a social pocket with sort of communal dining or a pizza oven or um, a pocket play space or, or something like that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and then this was another um, aspect of our design approach where um, we wanted to try and understand who this future community might be. Um, so between us um, and the team, we created this set of potential future users um, and went about devising these sort of backstories and personalities for each of them in order to sort of map their journeys and think about the types of spaces and the ways that they might be um, using the landscape. Um, obviously, this approach is not exhaustive by any means, um, and it definitely doesn't imagine the true range of personalities and requirements that a future community might have. Um, but it was definitely a useful tool for us to enable discussions and debates within the team and for us to sort of step outside of our own perspectives and try on someone else's while we're developing these spaces. Um, so at this detailed scale, um, 
after, you know, post design, we came back and we had another look at, at what we'd set out and we re revisited these personalities and it's almost like um, the Sims computer game. We're imagining these people that we'd invented sort of moving around and how they'd be um, using our spaces and interacting with it, with one another and um, spending their lives in this um, potential future that we've created for them. Um, so that's a bit of an overview of the, of the landscape approach. Um, and now I'm going to hand back to Adrian. Okay, so um, uh, on the left here, you can see a palette of Sitka spruce, Sitka, Sitka, Sitka spruce um, about to be made into some cross laminated uh, timber CLT panels as part of a study um, into homegrown timber uh, manufacturing in the UK by SNRG and uh, the Centre for Offsite Construction in Scotland. And amazing that they're actually progressing this for uh, uh, an installation at COP26 um, later this year. Uh, what we wanted to do was to explore, though, how we might change the demand side requirements through the competition um, and what this then might mean to the future scale of possible timber production in the UK. So we were exploring in our project not just how timber could be used for an element, but whether that could be designed to be supplied through species suitable for cultivation in the UK. So this included changing or looking at uh, conventional specifications of elements and how those might be modified to use uh, UK sources. So uh, different strength grades more uh, uh, alike to C16 and C18. So this doesn't work everywhere, and there are good reasons to use wood products from other countries, but uh, if we did change aspects of common supply to suit what we can grow and help restore our landscape, it could become more diverse, but also more productive. We thought that was an important idea to progress. So central um, to our uh, overall approach was the idea of using a balloon frame, and balloon frame systems are not new. They've been around in the, um, in, from the 1830s, so Wikipedia tells me in the US. It's also not new in CLT, as Michael Green Architects has, um, has got there first. Um, but what we explored was a continuous vertical uh, CLT wall element um, and frame the floor systems into the side of it. And um, this is particularly very different from conventional platform systems used commonly in housing. So what we did think, um, however, was if we use this, the walls could be thinner uh, than a conventional platform frame CLT to make them more economic uh, and more effective in the use of wood products and more airtight to meet the thermal criteria and quicker and easier to build with less fire stopping because of uh, the major panelizations in the walls and the lack of joints. And so we also played about with the idea very early on in the competition of stiffening these wall elements to make them even thinner using ribs and seeing if those internal um, uh, rib systems could be used for, uh, let's say, uh, better services distribution. So we we're thinking of, a, again, as a total system idea. What we also felt was that simple joisted floors seem to work really well in housing. And so uh, we don't uh, we don't really need to change that and we can just use CLT for the walls uh, and use another system for the floors. So um, in the development of the design, this one key idea of the balloon frame just continued through the whole process and you can see here a series of di diagrams showing some of the stages in the development of that idea from the original sketch um, through um, some of the stages of uh, the initial uh, competition entry that we did, uh, a more coordinated design use, showing some of the elements for fully detailed breakdown of all of the componentry um, uh, in, the, in the building design that we submitted at the right at the end. Okay. Um, and what we also wanted to um, explore was how to enable the design to become uh, a system that could adapt to other projects through a generative design process using a digital twin. So this would be our next area for major development. How do we use industry standard components and timber's ability to be easily machined to produce any geometry not fixed by standard geometries that might lead to sameness in uh, the development of housing? 
Next one, Patrick. So um, I personally don't like the term modern methods of construction or MMC, and I know it's used a lot, but many of the processes within MMC are not modern at all. Um, what I do like, however, is the idea of using advanced offsite uh, manufacturing to deliver buildings better and faster. So Positive House has a pre-manufactured PMV of about 76%, which means that about three quarters of the value is added off-site uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the building. Uh, and while PMV is sometimes used as a proxy for quality, you still need to make sure that the design and manufacturing achieves that and not just the uh, produces more productivity. So in our design, unlike um, many systems, I think we use about four of the seven typical standard MMC methods. So that's uh, not just one, that's, you know, system ideas coming from a number of different routes. So many offsite houses are hybrids and therefore important not to restrict thinking to perhaps just one methodology if that doesn't suit. And we also thought that a distributed model of manufacturing of components to suppliers who already have the capability to do this uh, was a much better idea than perhaps spending millions of, uh, of pounds on a new factory to try and do the same thing but probably not as well as the suppliers can do already. So our model was for components to come together in a near or uh, uh, near site or on site uh, flying factory to finally assemble uh, components before installation. And this also opened up the opportunity for local job creation as most of the work requires simple hand tools in this process. So this wasn't just for structure but also for the building services as Flo will hopefully now talk a bit about. The um, panel and chat concept uh, it describes the way the services are integrated into elements of the structure, in the case of the panel or the floor cassette, uh, and the chunks that can be pre-assembled, pre-wired, pre-commissioned up to a point, and then slotted in. As you can see, the Easy Joist system allows us to thread the air duct, the water pipes, the electric cabling through. The Energy Centre has air, electricity and water sections. The ventilation unit, um, MVHR, provides fresh filtered air uh, to the dwelling at nearly room temperature because it recovers heat uh, before exhausting from kitchen and bathrooms. The electricity section includes battery storage uh, and it's the nerve centre of the house. Um, and then the water section includes a hot water tank, which allows us to take in free energy from the sun um, through solar thermal panels on the roof. And we also included a mist sprinkler system, which um, means we can have beautiful exposed CLT, uh, cross-laminated cross timber, and keep the occupants safe should a fire erupt. How did we achieve this simple servicing strategy? It's all in the envelope and the passive house principles. So it's insulation, 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 uh, about twice what is needed for current building regs. 320 millimeters of wood fiber wrapped around the structure and with careful detailing in the zipping up um, so that it's thermal bridge free and airtight. So you're really keeping your, all the energy tightly wrapped in. On top of that, you have south facing windows that take energy from the sun in winter. Uh, but when it's warm in summer, they are cleverly shaded by these beautiful retractable overhangs and you can open the windows onto your gardens. And because our scheme banished cars to the outer edges, <laughs> that's unpolluted air you're letting in. Uh, the slab is insulated around and below. Um, so you don't lose heat through the ground either. So nice and toasty uh, with hardly any input of energy, if at all. Engineers love a graph. So here's one we, pre we prepared earlier in the first stage of the competition. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on this particular graph because it illustrates some of the questions you might need to be asking yourselves. What does decarbonisation what does decarbonizing heating actually mean? Uh, 
we were always going to propose a fabric first solution um, as that's the, the only real way to drastically cut the energy demand at source. So all the lines on this graph are for a passive house level of heating demand of 15 kilowatt hours per square meter or less per year. And just so you have an idea of scale, the average house in the UK needs about 10 times that. Um, so the first iteration of positive house shown here, and perhaps also the townhouse, only had a demand of about seven, and that's the green line on that graph. The flat line represents the carbon emissions from a gas-fired system. That's not going to change significantly over time. The line that starts at the top there is direct electric, which as you can see, when the building regs start to be implemented is way higher than gas, uh, but could now be about half um, in terms of emissions. The other lines are all uh, heat pump based systems, quite crudely mapped onto one of the possible scenarios for grid decarbonisation that would limit, limit us to a um, two degree increase in, in global temperatures. So as you can see, the electricity based lines converge to an extremely low level of operational carbon for heating, and that's starting now in 2021. Based largely on this, we took an early decision to go direct electric, because once you start putting in complex heating equipment, you then need to think about integrating that into your offsite processes. But also it means um, additional maintenance, replacement, and this would up your embodied carbon. Which leads me on to this next graph, um, and this one generated quite some discussion. Um, you can extend the idea further and also look at the value of the temporary store of carbon in timber buildings. So this was a study uh, as part of the Positive House project looking to go beyond net zero to carbon positive, and that's using Bill McDonough's use of the term. Um, the significance uh, and also the significance of pools of carbon in buildings. It shows carbon emitted or stored against a timeline, and it's very important to give context to what is you're showing in a graph. This isn't a single figure of embodied carbon for the building, but a progression through time. Uh, a typical house built today would look something like the top section of the graph. Everything that's put into the building has a carbon cost. Uh, which results in carbon emitted in extraction, transport, manufacture, construction, then over time in operation, and then any time there is a replacement or an upgrade. Because of the timber and wood products uh, used in Positive House, the embodied carbon is mainly through the concrete slab and the services, and that includes the photovoltaic panels. Um, but using timber products means that over the reference period, we are simply storing carbon that's been absorbed in the 20 to 30 year period before that. This doesn't mean it's completely carbon neutral or positive um, at the end of the day. That depends what happens at the end of the life of the building, which you'll have to um, think about. But it's incredibly important in terms of carbon budgets to save carbon now. Um, you might have to plant two trees for each one you cut down and change the system so it's a homegrown initiative um, for this to work. Um, but it will say you have to build efficiently, as Adrian uh, has explained. In other words, save materials and technology and make it so it builds, so, it's, so it lasts um, and is in harmony with nature. You can't really go wrong if you're in harmony with nature. If you're only designing a building to last 60 years, uh, you're failing future generations. So, you know, we're retrofitting 100 and 200 year old buildings now, which is great, but it's a massive challenge that we're facing. So, um, I guess my message is think holistically and long term. Over to you, Patrick. Okay, thank you, Flo. Um, I'm just going to finish our presentation and talk a bit about the architecture and architecture, I feel is historically been um, arguably some of the, the leading drivers of design and hopefully this presentation presentation is showing actually is anything but, you know, it's the importance of the uh, collaborative um, approach where actually everybody, all of us are working jointly together to create a solution. And, and I think that's incredibly important. So what's really key too is, I just want to begin by designing to context. 
and that is to respond and be very um, specific with what the local historical cultural significance of an area is. Uh, what, what is the local vernacular which has historically evolved over many hundreds if not thousands of years because it is that which is really important for us to uh, capture and integrate within any design because familiarity uh, with local communities is, is really important that that's where beauty comes from is is familiarity and local communities understanding what their local environment is rather than having something coming in um, to their community so the map in the middle uh, show is an overlay between key materials underground the principal materials underground so we're thinking about sourcing local materials and that that's the color hash um, hatches and then that's overlaid with these areas which are kind of the vernacular way in which buildings have been built historically so if you take um, Sunderland, for example, which um, my cursor might not be being shown for you at the moment, but hopefully you all know where Sunderland is on the map. It's, it's responding again to what those local materials are under the ground. So for example, here it's uh, predominantly limestone or sandstone. Uh, and then overlaid with that, what are the typical vernacular buildings, whether that's um, typically slate for roofs or the structure is typically stone and timber. Um, and the wall stone and brick. So it's, it's capturing those and seeing how we can modernize them, uh, engineer them um, with the idea that we can hopefully source local materials. The other big element which came through um, from the Home of 2030 competition brief uh, from all of the questions that were asked of uh, local residents and so on was about the need for flexibility and customer choice. So starting with actually, you know, we can't design prescriptively for individual families, uh, like Kate said too, right at the beginning about identifying user groups. It's really important to allow ideally those who are going to be living in these buildings be able to choose, you know, what kind of building they're going to be living in. And going for a, an off-site approach doesn't preclude that. Actually, it's an opportunity for us to design that in, starting with you know, creating a, the overarching geometry, the massing of the building, which has got that inherent flexibility to it, to then thinking about uh, the facade treatment um, to respond with a regional context, like I said before. And then also going even further and thinking about the, the bits inside, so the interiors, and actually what we wanted to do was not uh, be prescriptive about that and have your typical white box interiors that uh, volume house builders tend to, to have, but actually allow uh, a customize, uh, well, to allow people to customize their interiors. So whether they bring in their own kitchens, their own interiors themselves through their own choice of suppliers, or whether they click and choose from a palette of different options. So it's about customization, um, which, is, which is really key. And then I think when you're developing your designs for the competition for the Expo 23 competition is, is really thinking about, again, the users. It's, it's thinking about, okay, who is going to be living in these homes? Um, are they predominantly going to be families? Uh, if they're families, how are their needs going to evolve over time as the children grow up? Um, or if it's going to be, uh, as Gwen said too, an older um, a couple or a, a single person, what are their needs and, and what are their, how, how can their house adapt or their apartment adapt to their needs as they grow older and, and their needs might increase? And this is really key. And, and usually it's about, um, simplicity as well but it's creating a, a space which is adequate enough to allow the flexibility without being too prescriptive about it so that's where our approach came in with our competition was about integrating that uh, flexibility so there's a few different options here this is kind of our, our standard for our two up two down uh, home um, and then if, for example, um, Jake and May are the parents in this one, Harry is the, uh, the two-year-old, 
um, with his train set at the top, as you can see. But if, if they want a guest bedroom on the lower right there, you know, how can we move a wall or add in a wall retrospectively to create that guest bedroom, whereas before it was the office? Or the next slide, um, for example, is, is moving the living area upstairs. How can we do that without big intrusive um, changes to the structure? And uh, we've got now an accessible bedroom downstairs where the living room was. So we're, we're thinking about adaptability of different rooms um, and making sure that we can, we can achieve that. And lastly, actually putting the whole living room and kitchen upstairs and um, just having a completely accessible room with a small kitchenette and accessible bathroom at the bottom for those who are unable to walk upstairs uh, as well. We have got an option of a platform lift too. But the idea also about an off-site approach is, for example, could you even uh, with our CN uh, CLT panels route in, route in an area marking here saying this, this area of CLT could be removed in the future. You know, you do need to get a structural engineer. It's already been pre-structurally uh, tested to be able to remove that bit to create a new door or to open up uh, two rooms into one. Interiors are really important too. So I think they're stressing the importance of uh, light and space. You know, obviously yeah, this is kind of fundamental architectural approaches, light and space, isn't it? But I think also in terms of connectivity and, and connecting, especially in our, our post-COVID world, how do we visually connect with our community outside? Um, and that ties back into Kate's presentation about um, public and private space. So creating these connections is really important, especially when you're getting into the older generation who really do require they, those visual cues, um, you know, when, when they're inside, maybe more often than uh, the younger generation might be. So having connections to the exterior is, is really important. Um, health and well-being is incredibly important as well. And I, I know Tabitha is a uh, is, is always eager to promote this, especially with natural materials such as in engineered timber, and in particular cross laminated timber. Um, and there has been studies done um, in, in Austria, in America, in Japan, where it's been tested, people have been tested, and it increases your cognitive behavior and ability, um, it reduces your stress. Um, there, there's some very interesting statistics studies which are coming out which really show that actually going back to, for example, thinking about the saving on the NHS, how, how that can really help as well. So that, that's really key. Uh, nature and natural materials, bringing biophilia in as well, uh, connecting to people between different levels, I think is really important. Um, you know, we've got a, a very large plant in, in this one, but also having a void above and, that, and having that connection is really key. So it's, it's these issues which really do add value, um, which is really important because, you know, a cost consultant um, might be very adverse at um, pricing for materials or for labor or for uh, time on site. But actually it's very, it's more difficult, but really important to quantify what, quantify value. And how do we quantify value? Um, so, for example, we've used the five capitals, which is a model for sustainable development, as the core driver for our scheme. So that, that covers natural, human, social, manufacturing, and economic. Um, look that up. If you Google five capitals, um, you, you can look into it more. So, you know, for example, in pink, savings to the NHS, you know, just uh, one of the key um, factors for the NHS uh, the mo uh, I, I can't quite remember the statistics behind it, but the greatest number of um, the greatest amount of money spent on looking after people in hospitals is through a lack of thermal comfort, um, and through fixing that, as uh, Flo uh, said, it's all about thermal comfort first. It's a fabric first approach. Would actually have a, such a massive knock on effect to the NHS and save such a huge amount of money, we can then hopefully, the government can hopefully put that saved money elsewhere. Um, and it makes just you know, a huge amount of sense. So we've just got um, a, a few more minutes left. And I kind of want to tie it back to what Adrian said right at the beginning is that this is truly a collaborative effort. And um, all of these um, 
uh, practices, companies, consultants, individuals have uh, come together for our scheme, for the Home of 2030 scheme, and, and we're really proud of that. And it's been such a, a joyful, exciting time that we, we put into the, the, especially the second phase of the competition where, where our team grew to what, what you can see here. Um, and, and hopefully a lot of people actually listening are on this list as well. Um, and I, I think that's that that's really great to see. So I, I know Matt Stevenson hopefully is in the audience there from Ecosystems, who is also part of the SNRG. Um, uh, and hopefully there, there'll be many more of us in there too. So just to um, finish, uh, I think we've only got two minutes left now, so that, that's great. Um, Thank you very much. Really looking forward to the next talk. And hopefully that's helped you to frame some of the complex but um, exciting opportunities to design not just homes, but communities, which would be uh, hopefully tackling some of these um, environmental and social issues that we're, we're facing at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I think we can all give a, a virtual round of applause to that um, really, really interesting presentation. And I think the enthusiasm of you all for your your particular areas of work uh, really comes across. And, and as Patrick was just saying, then I think um, I, I certainly and, and as, as did the, the government and the rest of the team in terms of Home in 2030 really found this whole project a really positive thing and obviously positive house but it was a really positive piece of work it's really something that you know we, we, we've got some really major challenges at the moment and and actually uh setting ways in which we can help break down those challenges or i think uh, are, are are really key and and particularly in these quite challenging times is the word of 2020 wasn't it uh, as as well as you're on mute um so We've got some time for some questions, and it'd be great if uh, some people can, I, I don't know whether people can either put their hands up or type it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll have to ask some questions, um, but uh, it'd be great if we have some, some from some students or the rest of the audience. Um, but may, maybe I'll start off with um, just, just I think it, it, it might be really helpful just to understand um, from the team some of the big challenges and and what, what are the kind of the really big challenges to get over in in terms of achieving the brief and Kate and Patrick both mentioned the, the pandemic and, and actually did that actually kind of either change your direction or did it kind of just re-emphasize in terms of what you the direction you're already going on um, I don't know who wants to answer that the team you can go around and <laughs> what have you start and somebody else can answer yeah, Patrick <laughs> yeah I, yeah well I think Kate probably you're quite right uh, no Matthew I think more re-emphasized um when we started phase one of the competition uh the COVID was very much in its infancy and early days there and I think we were still grappling with the impact and obviously there is an enormous impact and life will return to what it was and I hope it won't hopefully this is an opportunity um, and and I, yeah, I, I completely realised that it would have been better, obviously, not to go through COVID, um, absolutely. But let's use this as an opportunity and make things better. And, and I think our design, you're right, emphasised, um, or, or, or the, the issues around COVID emphasised our design even more, and, uh, and not least with the landscape as well, and, and connecting the home with the landscape and... Um, and, and really emphasizing this idea of community. I, I don't know if Kate, if you wanted to. Yeah, I think um, the point at which we came on board the project, it was already very, very clear that we were going to be championing um, public space over private space. And that was fantastic for us. It's, it's always what we want to see because um, we just see so much more value in, in, in space that can kind of work for, for more people than, than just one or two. Um, and I guess uh, going through COVID and, um, you know, if all of the challenges associated with that just sort of emphasise that point um, even more for us, you know, going down to the park just, just near to my house, seeing the different ways in which people are using that space and, and sort of how much they're getting from it. Um, yeah, it just really sort of fed into the process, I guess. I think the technology really um, and the available 
apps um, really came into their own because we were already working in separate places in the country. So we had to remote work anyway, but it meant that all the, all the platforms up their game and <laughs> we used Slack and uh, it was a really, it was actually a really um, creative process to work remotely with each other. And uh, that, that worked pretty well as well. Yeah. Commercially, there's a there's a bit of a um, disconnect between the ambition of the competition, which is home of 2030, <laughs> and uh, the idea of what is seen as realistic to deliver in the current commercial market. So what we were doing is kind of fast forwarding through to what we thought was necessary to meet a series of ambitions, which are we can see coming and trying to find a way that the market could respond to those now. So commerciality in delivering it. So just delivering the passive house standards with more insulation above building regulations is gonna cost more money. Providing extra flexibility or bigger spaces in houses to meet the needs of people and adaptability is gonna cost more money. So the, the idea of value rather than cost and value to the nation and to, and to communities and to, to people is a really important part of this. So I think the biggest challenge is not that can we design the systems, there are many great designs that have come out through the competition which are implementable, but it's how do we actually procure those? How do we put the same values that the competition espoused into basic procurement by the government and into housing delivery overall? And that's going to mean changing the value basis um, and assist developers in delivering that value uh, and make it competitive. So to me, it's, you know, how to accelerate the delivery of things we know are absolutely necessary now in, a, in, a, in an emergency. Very much so. There was a, a the previous housing minister who um, kind of started off with the Home of 2030 idea uh, wanted to change the name to Home of 2025 because um, she was a little bit more impatient about the whole running of this program, um, although uh, <laughs> officials weren't quite sure that that was realistic. Um, but I, I, I think what Adrian just said is very important. Um, just there's some questions in the chat, so I'm going to try and do my best to uh, run through them. And, and um, we've only got so much time, so I'm not going to be able to kind of go into all of them too much. So if the team want to respond to them in the chat, uh, please do. Um, I, there's, there's, a, there's a timber one from Andrew Spence and uh, about Currently, we have such a low amount of forestry coverage. Is timber framed housing potentially causing more harm than good? I think that's quite a controversial question to, for, for this audience and in this, this team. Uh, and what would be required to ensure our forestry levels increase rather than be de depleted? Who, who wants to take that? I think that's a nice controversial one. Um, well, it's not that controversial. It's a really important question. <laughs> To idea what's the limit on um, what's the sustainable source of timber product compared to uh, the need for um, increased um, ecosystem services in terms of um, carbon pools and, and sequestration, um, public amenity, the protection of native, you know, of, uh, of long forest, of native forests, all those sorts of things are really important aspects of, of the thing. We're not going to be able to build, we, we, we can't wait 50 years for to build up forests to meet the current demand in housing delivery. So we, we, we're gonna to have to use what we've got. Um, sustainable supply and certification of products is a way of ensuring elements of, uh, of forestry uh, rate um, cutting that is, uh, is sustainable into the future. But we also have to match that with the need to plant more trees of the right type in the right place to meet our overall um, net zero carbon ambitions for 2050. So the bit under the line in all the government decarbonisation targets is the really important bit. So if you don't get carbon capture and storage, we're gonna to have to go to natural pools or building pools, as we're suggesting in this case, to, to meet those challenges. But yeah, it's, it's not gonna be supplied from the, the woodlands and small forestry elements in the, in the UK. So we're gonna to have to go broader to more established European forestry or uh, Canadian forestry elsewhere to meet um, an up, a scaling up of um, production. In terms of wood, 
but also we have to meet a scaling up of manufacturing production to meet the, the you know engineered timber panel systems as um, we were suggesting as well so it's not just the forest it's actually the manufacturing and the skills associated with the use of timber we need to be focusing on brilliant um i think that that very comprehensively answered that and i suppose it also links to some of what kate was saying in terms of the biodiversity that you can't make a, a, a solution in terms of both the, the landscaping and also the building that, that that is the same across the country it has to respond to its its local area um which is always was one of the challenges of putting a competition like this together um that's supposed to work for the whole of the country um brilliant uh maybe uh i'm just trying to oh, we've done the direct electric explanation that's very helpful thank you flo um what else do we have um yesterday we heard about decorating the outside with glass and the effect of heat loss how were we how was a glass wall ratio lose to balance energy of the interior light uh, and space feeling from uh, jk i'm assuming that's not jamiroquai from uh, jk from jamiroquai um so that's a really great question. And um, yes, I did hear Sally um, mention that, and it's a great expression to decorate um, the house with glass. Um, you, you really have to think through all the issues when you're, when you're designing these things. And every site will give you opportunities for compromise. <laughs> um, so ideally, uh, you know, Letty have come up with rules of thumb for, you know, um, percentage glazing on, on each um, elevation. And these are all guides to help you meet certain, uh, certain targets. Um, for your own specific project, you will have your own constraints and your own opportunities. Um, and so uh, I, we always start with those rules of thumb and then we see how we can sort of increase the amount of light here or the, the amount of glazing there for um, a heat balance opportunity and then um, you know what does that mean is it going to um, affect our overheating so it, it's very iterative and eventually you hope you get to um, to the right answer <laughs> um patrick i don't know yeah, no, I, I, well just to add into that and i i think this is really important when you guys start to design um, is, is again uh, emphasizing the need to listen and, and collaborate, listen to your uh, others in the team, other people who've got different expertise. And I think it was really a lovely process that we went through um, as architects, listening to Flo and Adrian um, and Kate and, and others in the team, because as architects, you come, you, you tend to you know, potentially want to create solutions which really um, are, are quite special and stand out through visually, you know, they visually look incredible, you know, whether, you know, big glass screens, going back to Mies van der Rohe, or, you know, you've, you've got some, you know, really incredible designs. But actually, what's beautiful is, is not necessarily that. What's beautiful is, is a solution, a solution that actually works for the brief that you're given and, and the brief that um, is eventually going to give you what you need to get. And, and one of the comments that we received from the, the panel um, when we did our interview for the second stage of the competition was about, and I, and I think actually probably all six finalists um, fell into this, was, was just about the, not necessarily the beauty, but the, the flexibility in terms of the massing, you know, pretty much all of our schemes, all of the six finalists were, um, were very simple, um, refined architecture. They, they were almost, uh, they pretty much all have pitch roofs to some degree. Um, they're all very, very simple. And there's a very good reason for that is because we were really thinking about the materials, about the performance of the, the buildings. And, and I, I really hope that's where beauty comes in, is, is actually integrating all of those together and, um, and, and, and making it work. So, yeah. Right, I, well, I think um, that's absolutely brilliant. And thank you for those questions and thank you for your responses, uh, Positive House team. Um, I think that's hopefully uh, filled people's minds with a lot more information and, uh, 
and and things so um there's one more question on there which i just want to reference but maybe one of you guys can maybe respond to it in the chat um about how if, if it's from matthew pembury which i think is a really interesting question um about if there's ideas from the project that can be min implemented in a community retrofit of existing neighborhood um, because obviously, you know, from year to year, 99% of homes is actually our existing homes. And um, if, if there's any ideas from the project that you can implement to existing, I think if you, if you can respond to that in the chat, that would be brilliant. Um, but uh, we should move on. Um, we should move, and thank you very much again, uh, uh, Positive House. So we're going to now move over to the uh, Forever Home uh, concept home. And uh, I think I'm going to hand over to Matthew Thomas from HLM Architects um, in Cardiff, hopefully. Yes, yes uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Matthew Thomas from HLM Architects, uh, lead architect for the for our Forever Home concept. Um, again, obviously, thanks for inviting us, Tabitha. Great to be here. Uh, thank you to our colleagues over at the uh, Positive Collective, that was a brilliant presentation, so both in content and delivery. So it's quite frustrating, we have to follow you. And, uh, <laughs> and, and also a lot of what um, our competitors said about the effect of COVID pandemic had on their design in terms of, I guess, understanding how you use your home, um, the impact of a house being too small and not having somewhere to work <clears throat> with correct lighting. Uh, and the positive impact that nature had. I know that being able to go out, we, we live quite close to a river, being able to take my children out into nature quite easily um, saved my sanity, I think. And that kind of came through into our design. Um, all of my colleagues who were working remotely, um, being able to share, uh, as again, as was, as was noted, the apps were improving kind of in real time, every other day functionality was added. And, it's quite interesting how you can design collaboratively whilst being remote. I'll just uh, share my screen. <clears throat> so I'm joined today with three members of our design team, Massey, Dan and Daryl, who collaborated with us to develop the design, um, especially in stage uh, phase two of the competition where the six shortlisted entries had to put a bit of meat on the bones of the concept effectively. Of course, we represent only a fraction of the full design team, uh, considering of architects, technologists, landscape architects, interior designers, sustainability consultants, engineers for m and electrical and structural, uh, and of course, contractors that, that are needed to respond to such a complex challenge. Um, hoping this presentation will shed a bit of light on the challenge and our design, how we came about uh, getting to the solutions that we, we presented. I mean, it's, it's clear that mass, mass housing as a building sector needs a radical overhaul. There's not enough homes being built. Too many of those have poor space standards and environmental standards. They form soulless, characterless estates without community facilities or adequate green space. The cars and tarmac take priority. Um, and in terms of responding to their local context, both in terms of nature and just the vernacular, I think are missing. Houses built in this traditional manner are inflexible. They don't support growing families, uh, home working, co-living or later life needs. They're not adaptable. And estates often become dormitories for commuters rather than healthy communities. People are forced to travel by car to get anywhere. The, there's not green links, cycling isn't safe. Um, and, and these are the challenges that I think we're all aware of. And this is obviously why the Ministry of Housing launched the Home of 2030 competition. Four key aspects that were identified to us in the brief were age-friendly homes, low environmental impact, supporting healthy living, and also these homes needed to be deliverable and scalable. These couldn't be bespoke, you know, bespoke solutions that would take ages to build. It, it had to be able to be rolled out in many ways one of the most important elements it had to be scalable and deliverable in order to ramp up and and face the challenges the to complement these uh, hlm we we sort of identified four of our own key themes that we wanted to explore community buildings sort of looking closer at the master plan shared social space formal and incidental provide a strong link to nature both 
from the home itself and then along the pedestrian and cycle routes. Um, play, incidental play was, was very important to the scheme. And, and again, during the COVID pandemic, I think that, that impacted a lot of us knowing there were people in the communities that had solus tarmac focus estates, whereas I was quite lucky because I lived slightly in the outskirts that within two minutes of my home, we have a river. Um, although during the winter when it was flooding and nearly flooding our house, it wasn't quite so fun, but uh, there's that daily change um, where you're in connection with nature from uh, from summer through to autumn. It's, it, it, it kind of grounds you and places you in that community. We wanted the design to be configurable, giving the homeowner more choice, uh, more control over from the point of purchase, what they actually buy. Um, and then adaptable, allowing the home to be reconfigured over time rather than constantly moving, uh, adapting to age. And, and if you live somewhere and heaven forbid you had some sort of degenerative disease or had an accident, having to uproot yourself to move rather than adapting your house to you is, is a huge negative impact. Uh, not just because you've suddenly lost connection with your friends and, and where you live, it's a major upheaval to your life. We began to get under the skin of these items and realized that one of the major issues we had to address was linked to scalable and uh, sort of deliverability. And we realized that the, the DMF, DFMA or Design for Manufacture, Modern Methods of Construction's principles would start to answer many of, many of the, the goals that we'd set ourselves. Looking at this sort of deliverable and scalable, it's clear again that the traditional construction is failing to deliver the quantity of new homes needed. We, as many, saw the potential of manufacturing sector to help fill the capacity gap left by traditional construction. There are a number of interlocked barriers to the potential of off-site manufacture of homes, though it's limited capacity to deliver, underpinned by a sort of an under-investment in facilities and technology. There's a lack of support from mortgage underwriters to an extent that is getting better, uh, but being able to insure some of these offsite homes. And one of the larger barriers is there's a lot of offsite systems available that can be a bit inflexible and don't offer interchangeability. And if we're fair, if you procure a design in one very bespoke system and then that company goes bust, how are you going to amend your design and is, has it been designed in such a way that it isn't adaptable or extendable because it's, it's just, just, just through the nature of the construction. So we wanted to try and overcome these different barriers and see if we could enable different offsite systems to be interchangeable, sort of more define a framework for space and performance rather than a, than a bespoke proprietary system as such. We turned during phase one of the competition to the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre uh, we had connections with them sort of in the University of Sheffield. They specialize in carrying out research into advanced machining, manufacturing materials, and developing practices to make things more efficient, increase productivity, uh, developing new products and design systems. They recognized some of the systems we were, we were trying to, to develop and some of the problems we had. And through phase one of the competition, uh, we followed forever home was the name of the concept and we came up with for eva we chose one character and we chose to follow her life from effectively 2030 through to 2090 and sort of on screen shows we would have her bio what's going on in her life she meets a partner then has children grows old ends up the family move in co-living they move out then the house has to be adapted to be wheelchair accessible and so on and at each point um, the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center helped us think, well, what, what would you be doing at that point? How would you be developing the concept? How would you be procuring, designing? Um, again, using generative design, digital twin technologies, golden thread, where you, you can source a material from its sort of being cut down in a forest, produced all the way through to being shipped somewhere so you understand fully the embodied carbon load. And then in phase two, we started developing more and we realized actually to take this concept further and to make it actually practicable and, and dare I say, buildable, deliverable, as being able to assemble it in all other terminologies based on DFMA rather than traditional building. We turned to Midgroup, who we knew at sort of cutting edge of offsite manufacture construction um, through their contributions to the Construction Innovation Hub. So I'm gonna hand over now to Massey 
from mid group who's going to talk through some elements and Massey, just tell me when you want me to move to the next slide. Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, good evening to all. Uh, my, my name is Massimiliano Cray. I'm the operations and residential sector leader for Mid Group. Um, I'm also a strategy board member of the Construction Innovation Hub's platform design program, which is working in collaboration with the Manufacturing Technology Center to transform construction procurement in line with a new value proposition, which was, uh, was discussed earlier. Um, as Matt alluded to earlier, our response to the Homes of 2030 competition is, is rooted in the recognition that the housing crisis is not merely about planning red tape, nor is it about building more homes, important as that may be. We believe it's about removing the ever-increasing barriers to entry to the housing market for an entire portion of the UK demographic. We believe that to do this, we need to change the way in which prospective property owners and housing authorities interact with the future built environment. We need to change the way that housing is designed, built, and ultimately financed. And we need to do this whilst optimizing the logistical, administrative, and planning approvals that inevitably any new construction involves. We believe this can be done using a 7D configurator, a basic prototype of which we prepared for the competition. This 7D interactive model will be a system agnostic platform design tool that will allow a prospective homeowner or housing authority to tailor the capital cost, construction period and running costs of their property digitally, all within a coherent pre-planning uh, pre -planning authorized master plan centered on sustainable living and thriving communities. While the master plan seeks to create the balance between nature, society and infrastructure within the 7D model, the configurator will provide the freedom of choice and expression for the individual housing authority. The process would start by selecting a particular plot within a master plan, either as a freehold, leasehold or social housing model. The planning constraints would be evidenced within the configurator and the owner would be would have to agree in advance to the maximum development extent of neighboring properties further to this there would be an option to purchase the land outright amortize the cost over a given period or option to pay ground rent in the leasehold model the costs of the selected option would appear in the configurator and links made to appropriate lenders and title documents the next phase would involve the owner or authority selecting elements from a digital library and dragging and dropping them into their own chosen plot within the configurator based on template grid sizes. All of the interfaces and connection details will be fully designed and the configurator will restrict the use of non-compatible elements during this process. It will effectively provide a cost plan for the particular venture and will be linked to elemental product rates all held within the digital library. From a design and supply chain perspective because the configurator is system agnostic it keeps the market lean and agile with competition from suppliers to have their elements present in the digital library these elements would pass rigorous quality environmental and design standards to be accepted as well as being fully compatible with other elements and the configurator would also provide the owner with a full o m manual before purchase something which is often uh, takes takes weeks, if not months, after completion to, to actually, uh, for, for, users, for end users to actually understand how their, how their building works. Um, and it would also project uh, running and life cycle costs. And the range of home options would allow for expansions and reductions, as Matt uh, mentioned earlier. It would allow a prospective owner to start with a modest starter home and could be scaled up to a three bedroom townhouse. And then later on in life scaled down throughout the owner's lifetime, effectively redefining the utility of the asset and creating a unique synergy between the building and the owner's story. There's also an opportunity to resell certain non-structural elements during this process, uh, creating a, a sort of secondary market and contributing to the sustainability agenda, as well as monetary gain for the, for the building owner. And we believe this is the future of housing provision, uh, creating more certainty at every stage of the design process, and not only for potential owners, but for the investment standards and insurance markets, which particularly in the current environment are finding it very challenging to quantify risk. Um, the solution we're presenting aims to capture that risk uh, and effectively design it out by providing decision crucial data at the start of the design process. It provides a platform from which a fully costed and programmed solution can be offered to the end user, uh, designed to meet stringent quality standards, but without sacrificing individual character. Um, this planning pre-approved pay-as-you-go option will not only remove barriers to property ownership, but also create the flexibility for people to tailor 
the financing of their housing experience to their individual needs. The system would also make for stronger communities by providing opportunities for work such as local assembly teams and configurator specialists, but also as technology evolves, a new wave of sustainability champions. And uh, I do believe that we have a, a video, uh, Matt, if we could um, click on that just to show uh, the, the very basic configurator and, and, and the kind of data that it, it can, it can uh, provide upfront uh, during the design process, during the configurating pro process. Um, and what you can see is the, the evolution of the, of the forever home uh, over, uh, over a period of time. Um, you can see that the total area changing, um, you know, every every couple of years as as uh, an expansion is is uh, is added, uh, and also the the, the various costs. Um, and I think that uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to pass over to Dan to to discuss the environmental engineering side of our response. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Bynum, Director of the Building Performance Engineering Team for Hydrock in Wales. Hydrock are multidisciplinary engineering consultants in the UK, and we provided m &E building services, structural engineering, energy and carbon modelling on the forever home. Um, sadly, I don't have a, as exciting a video as, as Massey, but um, <laughs> my focus will be uh, this evening on the sustainability and services, so I'll try and keep it as, uh, as exciting as I can. But, uh, um, the Forever Home exploits the low environmental impact attributes of off-site manufacture, less material waste, reduced carbon in production, and less noise and pollution in on-site assembly, <clears throat> but also critically the low environmental impact in the actual use of homes throughout their lifetime. The Forever Home also exploits low energy and intelligent green systems that are simple to operate and maintain. Homeowners will be able to improve energy efficiency throughout through personalized specification and performance of their own homes. Perhaps most importantly, they will offer its occupants very high energy environmental performance, such as ultra low energy demand, helping to mitigate <coughs> risk of uh, future fuel poverty and limiting the home's impact on the environment. Um, for us, achieving and demonstrating operational net zero carbon was a key driver for, for us as a whole team. Net zero carbon operational energy is defined as when the amount of carbon emissions associated with the building's operational energy on an annual basis is zero or negative. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the, our dynamic simulation energy modeling during this process was based upon achieving operational net zero carbon using the current uh, grid carbon factors available. Any future decarbonization that's expected at the national grid will only improve uh, the performance of the forever home further. Uh, reducing energy demand provides the largest opportunity and we used passive house principles and, and passive building design to achieve this. Uh, high performance U values uh, within the realms of, of obviously what is sensibly achievable and improved building air tightness were key to this. Uh, the Forever Home will be provided with energy efficient building systems. Uh, high performance air source heat pumps will supply heating and domestic hot water coupled with an underfloor heating system to maximize the efficiency. Uh, spare circuits on the manifold will allow the future, future rooms to be added as the scheme evolves throughout the lifetime of the owner. So it allows easy scaling up and down throughout that lifetime. To maintain a highly airtight air facade, a full mechanical ventilation heat recovery system will be installed. The MBHR units assist the reduction in energy and carbon usage by recovering heat from the exhausted air to preheat the fresh air provided to all the spaces. Uh, photovoltaic panels will be provided on each rooftop to reduce carbon and energy impact. Uh, PVs often produce energy though when it's not in demand and therefore don't match the actual home in use home demand profile. So a small uh, amount of battery storage is provided to offset this. The PV contribution of each house type uh, we modeled and calculated um, how much PV was required to achieve operational uh, net zero carbon, which we estimated between 40 meters squared and 60 meters squared, depending on which house type it was. Obviously, if the homeowner wishes to improve on this, they could select a higher PV contribution as part of the, the configuration process. Plug and play upgradable building services would be provided to allow easy installation, upgrade and removal as the house type uh, evolves throughout the lifetime of that homeowner. 
and the Forever Home sees homes as power stations enabling the national grid to benefit from actively managed homes that reduce burden on the network and importantly allow energy trading to happen between both. You install batteries and even your plugged in electric vehicles provide so a source of storage when required that can be utilised then during peak powers, peak powers, peak periods. After all, if you've got an electric a uh, car, it's a giant battery just sitting on your drive that could be charged or discharged as, as you see fit. Smart home technology will allow homeowners to control uh, things like appliances, thermostats, lights, etc., remotely via um, your phone and, and tablet. And this will allow demand led operation when grid electricity at its cheapest. Uh, you know, example this would be a washing machine when it will know, uh, intelligently know when to start based upon low grid demand. Uh, and therefore favourable energy prices for yourself. Um, at this point, I'll hand over to Daryl, who will talk a bit about life cycle carbon emissions. Thanks, Dan. Um, sorry, yep, I'm Daryl Fisher from uh, Greenville Consult. Um, yeah, my day job is a uh, bream assessor, but do all things like LCAs and you know, energy modelling, that type of thing. So not an expert in any particular one, but I've got a general knowledge of, of most sustainability subjects. Um, so. On this project, we was looking. I would look at the uh, the environmental impact of the materials, the constituent materials, what we refer to as the LCA. Um, you know, operational energy and carbon is only one part of the picture, and I think these graphs provided by Letty uh, are really good at visualising the impact of the you know, embodied carbon of the of a building over the lifetime. And I think you know we're going to get to a point, aren't we, where uh, regulated energy and unregulated energy is going to be minimised completely. The grid's going to be completely renewable. You know, all we got left to look at is is the embodied carbon of the materials. So, if any of you out there hasn't actually looked at it yet, I'd thoroughly recommend looking at the Letty documents, uh, the embodied carbon primer, which is where these uh, graphs are coming from. Are really good, are really good at visualising it and stressing the importance of those elements. Um, but I think what we really need to do is start thinking about materials as as more of a resource, thinking of of buildings as a resource bank rather than you know, throw, throw away elements. So I think that's one change of perception that the industry really needs to get behind. And I think there's a lot of people out there doing that. Um, but on this project specifically, you know, we, we really want to benchmark the, the materials within the building and we wanted to try and use the materials as efficiently as possible. So we did quite a lot of work on the actual structural frame. We thought that was quite a major element of the job. And we looked at different types of, you know, timber structures to see how we could ultimately get to the, uh, you know the best solution for this project and we really need to benchmark it as well i think um the rba 2030 sustainable outcomes guide has got some good benchmarks and i think it's something that we should be looking at for for most projects to uh, to see where we are and as you can see from the bottom bar chart on the right hand side there um you know we're, we're well within the 300 kilograms of co2e per meter squared which is recommended by the uh, reba 2030 outcomes guide um you know it's there's only so much we could do. There's only so much resources out there for, for much of the materials. And I think, you know, finishing materials and stuff like that, you know, we're going to specify, we'll specify as, as best as possible with health and well-being in mind as well. So, but I think if we really start to think about, as I said earlier, about this building as a resource bank, I think that will, will go a long way to kind of changing the perception of things. But also to say that this project is, I think the key benefit of a project like this, which is system agnostic, which can grow with the user, which can, you know, we can pull out bits, we can add bits in, and then, you know, and that asset then has a value as well, which could be sold on. I think that is the true benefit of this project. I don't think, um, you know, it's really recognized in those figures either. I think that's what's, what's really sets this project apart. Okay. Thanks, Darren. Um, right. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about healthy living and well-being in a minute. And in terms of the interiors here, that's that we're just quickly showing you. A lot of obviously what we're trying to do here is is create ultimately a healthy space, a healthy place for people to live. So it can be quite cold when you're talking about you know air source heat pumps and daylighting factors and whether it's overheating and you're getting enough air and and so on and so forth but ultimately it's about creating a, an environment which is healthy um, and that can take on many forms from material selection to the daylight to the layout to the adaptability for uh, aged living and so on and so forth and going back to the materials we worked hard that all interior materials specified were recyclable non-toxic 
um, as I say, worked hard on the specification and, and low carbon as well. So moving forward, sorry, I'm just trying to. So with regards to the healthy living and well-being, and again, I'll just, just recap some of the elements because we have rattled through it a bit quickly. We we worked with AMRC and, and Midgroup to try and develop an understanding of creating an ecosystem of of distributed manufacturing, uh, small and large, who could have confidence in the facilities using, you know, CNC machines. Could the panels be such a size that it's a low entry into the market for small, small assemblers and, and, and small, small companies just with some CNC machines and some knowledge of putting things together? Can we give people greater choice for of the layout of their homes through a configurator rather than trying to buy a home that isn't really fit for purpose? Uh, can we enable them to easily grow and shrink? And I'll show some more diagrams later, whereby you design a home uh, as a starter home, knowing that you might stay in that plot and expand, and that it's not the case of you're ripping out walls and bathrooms in order to extend your home. It's the fact that the design has been designed to grow, and it's a case of knocking out a simple panel whereby the structural frame and so on is screwed and bolted together leading back to the circular economy, rather than currently, if you would extend your house, you'd be getting a lump hammer, smashing the wall down, creating lots of dust and waste, and ultimately that would end up in a landfill in several skips. The idea would be we can unbolt the materials and they could potentially be reused further on. Maybe you unbolt part of your wall to build a small office studio in the garden because you're not ripping things apart. It, we, we've ensured that no materials we didn't use jib rock, we didn't use concrete where possible. Um, we didn't glue things together, we bolted, screwed and so on. But again, and that the idea, sorry, that idea of allowing people to grow and adapt their homes meant that you'd invest in your home such that you, you're investing in your community. You're putting down roots, strong roots, strong community. You're not moving around all the time. So throughout the development of the Forever House, we, we considered the well-being, healthy living and as I say, the importance of the community. So that meant we reviewed not only the way we procure and design the home and deliver the homes, but also uh, put a great importance in the setting in which we are in. We aim to create walkable, inclusive communities with local facilities and amenities set within a green, natural landscape, rich in habitat, incidental, social and play spaces. Uh, we set out to make a community and the environment to be as much a reason for people and families to stay in the homes as the convenience and ease in which the forever home could be adapted. And as you can see, on the image here, we every house type ended up with a sort of um, doors opening up onto the community, onto the community space. So you could sit and have a coffee in the morning and see your neighbours, you know, walking to work. You could see the children playing in those green spaces in the swale, which would end up being a play space as much as it would, you know, a swale and so on. So we we instantly rejected the use of confusing cul-de-sacs and dead end streets. We set about developing an urban grain that utilised and valued every piece of the space, either as homes, amenity or habitat, and kind of used the principle of greenification through densification. We wanted to create a kit of parts to be used in a master plan. Um, the image you see is from phase one, where we didn't have an actual live site, so this is why it's <laughs> quite so regimented. Um, we developed a legible tartan grid of traffic calmed access lanes, designed to accommodate mobile cranes, knowing that we could offer the house as a, a volumetric solution if possible. And we, we, we designed the master plan to accommodate how it would be built or assembled, delivered on site. Avenues with parking bays, pedestrian cut throughs, um, and importantly, green living streets that crisscross the landscape, opening onto large green communal areas of habitat, amenity, community and play facilities. Um, bringing everyone together. The four principal routes each had a distinct character and purpose, uh, not only allow movement through the master plan, but also define the development area for our forever home plots. The plots, we, we chose the terrace typology. It, it allowed an efficient use of land uh, and also provided a consistent standardized plot, which we arranged in sort of complementary adjacencies. I can talk a bit more later. Um, each with a strong relationship to the green living streets and enough space for meaningful growth. So we did have a very defined walled area because that was the area which you could expand into um, and grow into. And 
and I must say we we had some strong debates in the studio over how how much that breakdown was but a lot of us had young children and again during the lockdown uh let's be fair we could open the, the doors to our garden if we're lucky enough to have one i've got a five and a seven year old and they'd be running around in the garden naked with walker pit water pistols and the dog running around so <laughs> we kind of had to pen them in they'd be halfway to god knows where if, if we if we let them out the front um but on these terraces of the forever pots we also complemented it by mixed use 10-year apartments as you can see on the right hand side the idea was that these would form communal mini communities that they ensure that there's a range of housing options available and ensure a diverse rich dynamic community and an injection of, of fresh blood the each forever plot essentially would carry a set of what we call neighborly rules for each typology which would include a minimum garden space suds feature um, parking and importantly the maximum permitted development um, with the planning authority approving this theoretical maximum form allowing sort of expedited planning approval and alongside these standard rules there's also the option for planning authority to impose contextual development rules covering roof form materials maximum height which means you'd allow the authority to create a cohesive aesthetic or to be sympathetic to regional vernacular or conservation zones for instance so these simple rules that we tried to create allowed for the development of a diverse range of house typologies, each with progressive stages ranging from starter home through to family home, co-living and independent living and wheelchair accessible. The diagram on the left hand side, top left, the idea of that was almost a roadmap that if you did purchase a site as a starter home, you could then start understanding how you could extend you wouldn't have to go out to an architect and say, well, well what do I do now? I want, I want to make my house bigger. The idea was you could follow a route and, and expand your house logically. And it would be designed in such a way that, as I say, you wouldn't be ripping out walls and making waste. You would unscrew panels and kind of bolt on a new element. Uh, the, the diagrams below it on the left as well are kind of progressions through from starter, two bed, three bed. Um, and again, how you can adapt it through to uh, wheelchair accessible so you could, you know you'd have a knockout panel allowing you to put a, a platform lift um complementing and again these apartments provide a more whereas the apartments provide a sort of permanent um, presence in the master plan not changing quite so much but a variety of tenures in them allow for temporary accommodation short sure regular injection of say of new blood so if the homeowners are able to personalize their homes through a palette of interchangeable elements, giving them a unique character uh, and allow a range of uh, low carbon finishes and materials, coupled with the sort of distinct and ordered roots, providing a strong, strength, strong sense of place. The, the idea is that the top elevation on the left is, say, year one, and then it would adapt and change over time, again, with a circular economy and the way the building is bolted and screwed together, whereas the top right image would be more of a planning lockdown you know, vernacular or materials, just to give you a sense of character. So the tartan grid strategy of access lanes and green living streets has been applied to the provided site. Um, and we, what we tried to do is follow the development plan as well as closely as possible. We had the terraces following the perimeter of the site, opening up into a, a large central park with amenity, social play spaces, suds, sport facilities, and extensive habitat. And the idea is, they all link together so the it's not just a habitat it forms a sud when it's in the summer that sud space which is habitat is also a play space and a, and a social space as well and it culminates in this image here and again we we like the idea of reforestation and and a mini forest that transitioned into a more dense urban setting with urban public square event space community center retail office space a library of things again linking the community so you can borrow lawnmowers, you know, people buy a lawnmower, they use it once a month or when you get told to, <laughs> in my case. Uh, and other things like workshops and so on, that's thing that you can actually do, make make things, fix, fix things and so on. So it's not such a throwaway, but all the things that a community needs. And of course, this communal space here, even though we had to provide 300 homes on the master plan, this space would, the idea would be serving more, more than just the 300. Um, 
and again, wrapping up, effectively, it was a very large mixed disciplinary team with really interesting debates internally of how, how we can solve a lot of these problems and what are the issues. Every time you think you've fixed something or sorted something, it throws up other issues. You come up with a standard dimension, which you can fit multiple construction types in there, and you start wondering about uh, how does that how does that allow you to be volumetric versus so a more stick or panel system? Can it be all of them, uh, once and the other? And how does ensuring that your carbon zero um, and recyclable affect how, the aesthetics of the building and how do they interplay off each other? So, um, well, thanks all. I'll, I'll stop talking now because I'm sure you have questions for the rest of the team. Um, but yeah, that's, that's effectively the forever home. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was, uh, and, and the rest of the team, uh, a really great presentation and um, lots of very interesting features about, about the project. I think um, it's, it's kind of difficult to think of one particular standout piece. Matthew, while, while you're still on, on mute, um, the, the personalization of, of the homes, do you see any dangers of that? And, and what are the potential challenges with with that kind of, of, of way of go about doing things. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, and again, we, myself and Massey and, and James, who can't be here, unfortunately, from the Advanced Manufacturing Research Unit, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, we did talk about how, how that would work with the configurator and how, how could you bake in rules and could you, if you're personalizing it, but, but giving almost a set of options to, to make things easier. So you're not, the, the individual isn't necessarily there just trying to draw walls in a certain location, they may be able to enter in and say, look, um, at the moment, or I'm a wheelchair user, so maybe they can click certain options, which which would lock options down a bit more, and then just open up, okay, well, I'd like a an open plan or, or, or an upside down house with bedrooms on the top floor. So you've almost got preset options you can have. And we started talking about, if you had almost a digital twin, could you employ an architect to be slightly more bespoke? So you almost give them a brief and, and they lock it down. And the idea is that because the 70 BIM model could then be sort of sent to a manufacturer, you're not being um, you're not being charged more because ultimately it's it should be as effective to produce that design as another design because it's systematized. Um, so in answer to your question, which I haven't fully answered, the dangers are you want to make sure that somebody's designing a house that is functional, you know you have to understand that maybe there's something which says, look, we don't advise you do this because those colors don't offer great uh, contrast. If, if you are, you know, have a problem with your eyesight, they, that wouldn't be wheelchair accessible. Um, just flag up a warning. So, so it's giving people choice, but locking it down a little bit, it's, it's not a complete white piece of paper, do whatever you like. It's, it's choice within defined options, I think. Um, but within those options, hopefully you have multitude of, of options you can do yeah and i think sorry just to add to that is is that ultimately the, the problems are always in in the in the connections uh you know the interface is, is always the problem so if if we manage to to ensure that any elements that are brought into the digital library have those connections already predefined so the best analogy is lego Lego uh, sets, they have a, a, a single connection detail and that's why they're so versatile. You know, you can build pretty much any, any form out of a Lego set because it has that one connection detail. So if we manage to, and, I, and I'm not saying that you'd only have one connection detail in, in something as complex as a home, but you would have a series of connection details that are all pre-designed and pre-thought through <clears> so that any new elements that are, you know, that, that are, are provided via the supply chain um, uh, any new elements that get brought into that digital library have to uh, have to be compatible and have to you know have those th that connectivity designed into them. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's really the, the sort of thought process behind it is that anything that's brought into the digital library ha has been has been validated from a connectivity perspective. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, please do. Uh write uh, some <clears throat> questions in the in the question box and um, Massey um, a question for you perhaps um, your, your work with the uh, advanced uh, manufacturing research center um, 
do you think what are the kind of the the the, the lessons learned from other sectors that can be uh, really kind of taken on board and and maybe some examples from other sectors that can be taken on board <clears throat> in the, in the um housing and and building world i think it's it's quite good to understand some of those kind of that, a, a different way of thinking perhaps yeah, I think so. Um, James James was actually who's, who's not on the call was from the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. But I've been doing a lot of work with the, the Construction Innovation Hub, who are um, who derive a lot of their thinking from the the Manufacturing Technology Centre. And uh, certainly, there's there's some there's a lot that can be learned from the aviation and automotive industries. And I think, but I, I think it's really important not to confuse the two because very often parallels are drawn and, and they have very different drivers. Um, so particularly in, in the aviation industry, um, the kit of parts that they develop, they, they run a number of designs in parallel, um, you know, testing engines for noise and performance metrics and, and the like. And then they choose whichever is the best. And I think that that, that, pro that process isn't a luxury that we'd necessarily have in the construction industry. Um, and so I think it's it's really important to to ensure that uh, I, I guess what, what I alluded to earlier that the the interfaces is where the problems always arise and certainly the projects that that we work on it's it's poorly thought through key principles that that have just been forgotten from day one and then you know you get to a sort of stage three stage four design and we end up having to be schemes and that just wastes more time and, and 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 so i think you know starting with a set of very key principles that align a project with the potential for mmc and and of course you know mmc isn't for every project and i think that's 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 really important to you know that, that's definitely what we've we've found through the process um is that you know the bespokeness of a solution has has to be there albeit if you can lock in certain key design principles it it certainly enables, uh, uh, you know, uh, the viability, the, the cost elements to be uh, to be uh, kept at the at the forefront of consideration. So, thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of other questions which um, you guys might be able to help answer. Um, so one of them is around. Um, the the flexibility and the adaptability of the design and um whether the average family would be able to afford extra panels um i i, I think that's quite an interesting uh, question and then uh, the, the next question in terms of can you see a world where there is modular housing as standardized across uk europe and worldwide i know the automotive sector have always talked about world cars but uh, implementing that's always been quite a challenge for them over the last sort of 50 years yeah any thoughts on that Absolutely. And I think that that is a, a great idea. You know, if you could buy and sell panels on eBay, I think that that is, a you know, I mean, look, th we, this is all about creating a new marketplace. It's it's not necessarily about changing, you know, how we do housing today. It's about creating a, a, a new vision for how we could deliver. And I think, you know, certainly the advent of, of the, you know, the digitalization of, of, uh, of a lot of industries opens up huge, huge possibilities. And you know, we, we, we considered that secondary market as being quite interesting because you could end up having a range of different options to expand or contract the house, uh, you know, depending on, on personal, personal situation. So, it, you, you know, for example, you, you could remove a panel from the top, the top of a neighbouring property. It could be sold to, you know, a couple of houses down and used as a shed in the garden. And that's a reuse model. It's, it's, it's not, you know, go and buy a new shed. It's actually, does anybody in the community have a, a panel that they're, you know, they're in a particular part of their journey and they could sell it on? And, and everyone, yeah, you know, one, everyone's one, a winner. One of the things in our kind of narrative in, in phase one, um, obviously we, we ended up going up to a co-living house. And the idea was that instead of, you know, downsizing um, your property and moving somewhere else, the idea was because you've got such strong roots in the community, you you downsize your house on your plot. So you unbolt part of your house, uh, you gift it to your son or daughter because it's taken up unbolted and um, put together. And what we looked at is when we were getting figures off Zoopla, if you were kind of selling a three hundred thousand pound or two hundred thousand pound house and buying another house, you know, the, the average costs were going up to seventeen thousand more by the time you had 
stamp duty, um, removals, solicitors' fees, estate agents' fees, moving. And then when you move to a house, remember, that house might not necessarily be to your liking. And then all of a sudden, and you think of the carbon load there, you start ripping out a bathroom, which is kind of functional. You just don't like the look of it. Putting in kitchens, that, again, maybe if you're an older person, all of a sudden you've got to change the kitchen to have, you know, um, different bathrooms which are accessible and so on. So you, you think of all that cost and think, well, okay, that's going to cost me £20,000 just in the move without actually gaining anything to go to a smaller house. Or, okay, it's going to cost me £15,000 to get somebody to disassemble the house I'm already in. And then I can gift that to my son and I'll pocket £5,000. So it, those were the kind of ideas. And I say in terms of that affordability then could the average family afford it well the idea is is because you're staying put longer you're growing your house and as i say instead of going oh my god i've got to pay ten thousand pound stamp duty you go well i'll i'll spend ten thousand pound and put a you know an office working space that i've bought second hand off you know the forever home ebay app and i'm putting in my garden so i'm we're staying put you're not wasting money on traveling around so so that's the idea it was changing affordability it was changing the look of it you're investing in your property rather yeah. than giving money to an estate agent who didn't do a very good job <laughs> maybe, maybe government that. has a role here as well in uh, as opposed to extending the the stamp duty <clears throat> uh, holiday maybe it's a reduction in vat in terms of retrofit and, and building product materials and things so it's not just yeah. just on new build that's a it, little bit of a a kind of a, 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 a level playing field people like to talk about. <laughs> That's exactly right. And Massey tried to allude to, you know, you're changing the way mortgages work and so on, because if you're buying a home that you can adapt more easily and then you're going to stay there, then the affordability matrix must come up because they're, they're aware you're not spending so much money on on all of those wasteful things. So, yeah, so, so it's certainly when we were, just to, to add to that, it's a really good point. You know, when we were um, developing the 7D model, um, you know that that initial capital cost, you know that affordability criteria to get to get started to set up on a plot, is by far the biggest <coughs> barrier to entry. You know, getting a deposit for a lot of uh, young people today is 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 by far the biggest barrier to entry to the housing market. And so, by starting small, you you know you could you could open up huge swathes of the population to to, to having access to housing. And there and then you know. As they, as they evolve, as they, as they go down the journey, they can, they can scale up. And I think that's, that's really the key. It's trying to, to open up opportunities. Um, and I think that, yeah, as, as Matthew alluded to, you know, mortgage providers will change their risk profiles in accordance with that model. Um, they will have to because, you know, and, and, and ultimately the risk that they take on, if there's a commitment to a certain plot, is very different to, you know, speculative behavior. Um, so it, it's, it's quite an interesting space, I think. And obviously it still needs to be developed, but certainly um, trying, to, trying to challenge the status quo. Brilliant. Um, there's a couple of other questions here, which I don't know who wants to take forward, but one of them is around um, how this can be used for perhaps for, for self-build. I think, Matthew, you were kind of beginning to answer some of that. And um, also about how, how this could be communicated to the, the general public. Um, I, I like to think of myself as a lay person, um, so occasionally I can understand some of this stuff. Um, but good ideas around that um, would be really helpful. Uh, I'll, I'll say one quick thing and I'll hand over because otherwise people get sick of my voice. Um, again, it's a shame James isn't here. He had, we were talking about interesting ideas. <clears throat> In one of our kind of narratives when Eva was, I don't know, 42 or something, it was the idea that you'd have almost augmented reality apps, which because you've got a digital twin of your house, then you know where all the wires and so on are. You know not to put a nail or a screw in that area if you're amending mending something. And if you're getting a flat pack, um, you know, garden studio flat pack element, that it could be a um, almost like a YouTube video there would show you how to how to develop it and because you'd have augmented reality you, you could almost see where you are at the time you know you could almost hold your, your ipad up to the structure and they'll say oh, oh hang on you've put this in the wrong place that should be tab a goes into slot b um so there's quite interesting discussions around there and the idea that everything's screwed and bolted together with fairly standard materials um i think would help help those but ultimately let's be fair buildings are 
quite complex elements, but, but there we are. Um, I think I'll hand over to, to someone else for more of the other questions, because again... Um, um, all... Just to pick up on that one, I think um, I think the key to really communicating this to the general public is probably the the, communi the configurator, isn't it? Is if you get a really sick, slick product online, which people can play around with, you know, they send it around, say, build your dream home. And then <laughs> alongside that configurator, you've got the running costs of it. You've got the embodied carbon, the environmental impact of that, you know, the potential cost of the actual construction of it. I think that's a, it's probably a good way to reach out to the public, isn't it? And to start spreading the word and having a slick product like that would go a long way. Yeah, and I think I suppose just to, just to add to that, the you know we're all very used now to using technology, and obviously some of the older generation, like my parents, aren't quite so good. But the idea was you you could get somebody to help you. You could get a you know sort of configurator arch architect to work with you. But again, that the you know what you're getting is is a is a sort of quality design in some ways. Um, and again, so it's just user-friendly interfaces that I think we're, we're a lot better at generating now um, on all your apps. Just easy to use, aren't they? Yeah, and I, th and I think that the, the real driver is really around certainty. And, and you know, all risk is, is, is ultimately linked to, you know, certainty or uncertainty. And I think that with the configurator, you know, the, the biggest thing that will attract <coughs> people to it is that it, it does link back to the supply chain. It links back to a manufacturer who is committing on price to that particular element that you've selected. And, you know, you could even take it to another level and start, you know, uh, linking it to live market rates, for example. So the price of steel has gone up by 40% since June, uh, since July. Um, you know, that would, that would be a massive, massive hit to take if you designed your, you know, a house, a self-build, in steel now if with the configurator because the time frames are, are reduced you could actually monitor you know actually this is the best time to build in timber right okay click <laughs> and 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 you order the materials um so there's you know it, it, it's really about sort of trying to redefine the process i guess and 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 re-quantify risk and, and and define more cert you know provide more certainty to the process so I was just going to actually mention um, Tesla, you know, 10 years ago, who would have thought that you'd be uh, buying a, a car off the internet without seeing it, you know, and um, whilst, uh, you know, a Tesla's uh, undoubtedly there's less options you can choose if you've had a play around, they don't own one, uh, have nothing to do with them, they're not endorsing anything, but, um, you know, if you have a play around it, it's quite intuitive. So, you know, it's easy to see how the, um, you know, the way things could go with this. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> amateur mistake there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting discussion. And thank you, team, for your answers. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I think uh, thank you from myself to both the teams, the, the Forever Home and also the Positive Home House. Uh, I think we've had a, a really good evening uh, and hopefully educational. I hope a lot of people have learned all sorts of different things. I know I certainly have. Um, and I'm just going to hand over back to Tab. Go on mute. <laughs> Unmute. Um, oh, it always happens, doesn't it? It always happens to one person, and it would be me. Let me close a couple of things down. <laughs> and I'm now longer, no longer on mute. I, I'm having a, whew, a meltdown moment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Gwyn, for chairing and uh, corralling all our fantastic designers tonight. Um, so Adrian and Florence and Patrick and Kate and Matthew and Daniel and Daryl and Massey. I'm not going to honestly try and pronounce your name. I will get it so wrong. But bringing it back to the um, competition. So this is the area in Sunland that our participants will be looking to design um, their schemes on. Um, this is the actual site here. Um, next to the river, uh, just the red part with the uh, Vaux housing zone. 
Um, and this is what we want you to do, an indicative master plan, the landscape and streetscape for 100 innov innovative new homes. But we want you to design, engineer, detail and cost one family three bed home. So in detail and with a maximum footprint for your home is nine metres by six metres. So I think it's a little bit smaller than um, the footprints of our, um, our presenters tonight. Um, so this was uh, uh, evening two of Desirable Homes and Communities. I'd like to thank our sponsors. We couldn't put this on without them. So the Confederation of Timber Industries, Akoya, Rothoblas, Timber Decking and Cladding Association, PEFC, the ASBP, Wood for Good and BSW. And tomorrow night, we have evening three of Desirable Homes and Communities, where Mark, Jay and Neil will talk about the systems that they not only design, but they manufacture and um, pretty much some of them erect them themselves too. And chaired by Lynn Sullivan of the Good Homes Alliance. Um, and then on Friday, we let our hair down, go to the virtual pub. Um, we encourage our speakers and our participants throughout the week to come and join us and just discuss about what we've learned and how we do things differently uh, in the future. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you all so much for attending and I'm gonna now stop recording. Stop.